uh, first, I want to make a clarification that um, in my speech, I think my concern uh, was really about uh, what if local uh, NGOs would sometimes, because of capacity, would need uh, foreign participations in, in terms of foreign speakers in their public assembly. I think that is my main concern. I share with the ministers uh, concern or, or, or a position that we should not have foreign entities organising such events here. And that one I would agree with the ministers. So I think my question here is that as long as there's enough clarifications so that civil societies feel comfortable and they feel that they can still continue with what they're doing, I think uh, that would be really very good. And uh, I just want to check some more with the minister. Uh, in this, in a particular case whereby, for example, an NGO who already has a staff member who is a foreign, who is a foreigner and is working full time with the NGO, and they happen to be organizing a particular event, uh, would that be uh, Would that be actually uh, be a problem under this new amendment? Uh, yep, that's my clarification. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Cook, it's a bit difficult to answer that question in vacuum. Uh, it depends on what role that foreigner plays. If he is a key person and he is going to be organizing everything, and uh, really it is his influence that impacts on the way the event is organized, the panel is chosen, towards specific political ends, then I think that is foreign interference. And it will not come as a surprise to you that NGOs are a favorite route for foreign agencies to channel funds and pressure governments. A lot of foreign agencies, when I say agencies, you know what type of agencies I'm referring to, they're not going to put up their hand and have a signature. It will be through NGOs. So we need to be very careful. But you will see, I've taken some trouble to take you through the amendments that, uh, and as I said, I think uh, the bill that is presented and your speech passed each other by like ships in the night uh, because they are not engaging with each other. Because your speech was about Singaporean, Singaporean civil society. So I said, we shouldn't have top down, we should have bottom up, we should encourage Singaporeans, we should make sure that our people participate. And I said, I agree entirely with you but there is nothing to do with Clause 4. Clause 4 specifically is targeted at foreign participation. In fact, uh, the best example I can give you, as I gave in my uh, wrap-up speech, is again Pink Dot. Last year, when we said, my ministry said, no foreign participation, there was considerable concern. There were these arguments about what amounts to politics, because my ministry issued a statement saying that we have always taken the position that foreigners cannot engage in political activities. In our view, LGBT issues are for Singaporeans. Uh, there were these, uh, uh, what I would call, uh, issues around the definition of politics. Second, there was concern that when we say no to foreign sponsorship, for example, for Pink Dot, it will impact on the event. But actually, as you see, based on media reports, Singaporeans are stepping up. Again, the government is neutral on this point. I made that clear last year. I make that clear this year. But whether it is pro-LGBT or opposing LGBT, that's a matter for Singaporeans. And Singaporean companies, Singaporean sponsors are stepping up. So I would say, tell your friends, the civic society, have some confidence in themselves, and have confidence in Singaporeans. Step up. This bill is not aimed at that. Don't think that you can only do well by getting money from foreigners and getting foreign participation in. Now, that's quite separate from having a foreign speaker or two in panels, getting their expertise, and by and large, those sorts of activities, you know, one has got to assess case by case, what's the nature of the event, what's the 
issue at hand. Now, it will be difficult to stand here and give you a clear black line to say it applies to this and it doesn't apply to that. Apart from anything else, a particular event held in one set of circumstances, domestic and regional and international, may take a completely different complexion when the regional and international circumstances change and domestic situations change, which is why these are matters where you have to give the power to the executive and let the executive decide. Yes, you want another clarification? Yes, Mr. Cook, please keep it short. Thank you, uh, Minister, for the uh, clarifications again. Yes, I'm actually very happy with what you know the Pink Dot has been able to get all the uh, support locally. And I think that uh, what I also want to reiterate, which is one of uh, our fellow members' uh, point, is that uh, importantly, uh, that Singaporean organizes it and we have our say. But here, I, I think here, especially with regards to uh, how the commissioner is going to make the decisions, uh, uh, members have actually suggested could they actually have an independent group uh, community to help them? So that's one. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Mr. Koch, let's follow this analysis through. I have explained why it doesn't make sense to have this go to a judge in terms of what is a political end, in terms of what's the potential impact on society, in terms of whether there can be a public order incident, whether this is a particular case for foreigners to be involved, to be allowed to be involved, to be not allowed to be involved. These are all matters of governance. A weak government without the desire to decide on these things will pass it on to a judge. And it will result in a, the matters being co constantly being litigated. Our position is that we will make the decision. If we are wrong, we'll take it on the chin. Our people will know whether the decision is being exercised properly or improperly. And if we keep making decisions improperly, any government will face the consequences. Okay, so that's the framework. Now, you say, why should it be the Commissioner of Police? Why not somebody else, another panel, an independent panel, something like independent of the police, I presume, advising the Commissioner? You know, what is that panel going to do that you think the Commissioner is not able to do himself? And uh, Really, all of these are suggestions to dilute the exercise of power by the authority, the Commissioner of Police, which the bill seeks to vest. I have said our approach to governance has been to vest that authority and say that person will be responsible. Sometimes, and there are plenty of examples where you have panels which either outside of the statutory board or uh, executive, which either advise or sometimes actually make a decision. But that relate usually to matters of morality, taste, um, public, uh, uh, you know, what the public might find acceptable or not acceptable in terms of uh, social mores, those sorts of things I can understand. But uh, this is a matter of governance. Is this a security event? Is this an event that may have security implications? Is this an event where I should allow foreigners to take part? That is why the people elect us, to make those decisions. If we get it wrong, the people will tell us. So I'm not saying no to public advising, the executive. But I think there are a range of areas. There are some where clearly the public should advise, sorry, public panel should advise. I don't think this is one of those. Yes, Mr. Cook. 
I'm sorry, but just one last point to reiterate. Uh, ministers, I think uh, a lot of societies, civil society also want to build that trust with the government. I think it goes a long way for both sides to actually to work together. And in with regards to this bill, I think if I hope that actually if there were actually more consultations in the process, that would actually have cl clarified a lot of things. Thank you. Well, what I can hope is that uh, you, with your contacts with the civil society, will explain to them what I have explained to you. And, uh, you know, it, I think it's absolutely important to have that trust between citizens and the government and also civic society and the government. And thankfully, Singapore, in the context of overall plunge in uh, trust in government in the rest of the world, we are in a fairly, in fact, quite a healthy position in terms of how much the people trust the government. And we have to make sure that we work very hard to maintain that trust, because trust cannot be demanded. It has to be constantly worked for. And you've got to continue to prove that you're worthy of the trust. And uh, this bill, our own view, looking at it, is that when people see, and when people see clause four, first of all, we didn't think that there was any issue of trust when it came to the commissioner of police directing that an event shall include extra security measures. If we didn't do it, people will say, why didn't you put in those security measures? Second, the other major change, as I was speaking with you, is on uh, events, and I read straight from clause four, clause four, two H, directed towards a political end and be organized by or involve the participation of any of the following persons, an entity that's not a Singapore entity, or an individual who is not a Singapore citizen, and then it goes on to talk about what's a political end. We didn't think, it didn't strike me at all that this would raise any questions of trust with Singaporeans. Why should it? We are saying that this is about foreigners. It may affect, now that I've listened to you, maybe it might affect the people who misunderstand the scope of the bill. And so I think it is our duty to go out and explain, government's duty to explain what this bill covers. So to that extent, thank you for helping us. Uh, I now understand it better. Thank you.